Canto 2 of The Paradise opens with one of these moments when Dante, the poet, addresses us, his readers, directly when he breaks through the fourth wall and turns straight to us. And it's the most striking case of this because it's a really strong warning. In essence, he says, stop reading now unless you're really ready to follow what I'm going to communicate. He said it would be better to stay at the ports of the inferno or the purgatory than to try to carry on following him through the, the, the hugely much more expansive seas of the paradise. And it's very striking that he should say this, um, but I think it makes sense. He's saying in a way, don't just read this for the poetry, as if the poetry was all, just the kind of joy of the words, of the images. No, this is about actual illumination of reality. It's a bit like the person that gets caught in the mystery, but never really gets a full vision. You know, they just like the peak experience, but never start to discern what that peak experience means. It means they get addicted to the trip. Or it's like someone who gets so caught on the experience that they never really deepen their understanding. They never take it into themselves so they're actually transformed. They just stay kind of blissed out or tripping. Or again, it's like someone who so enjoys the drama of the peak experience, of reading the poetry, of the ups and downs of life, that they never actually gain wisdom from it. They never actually gain insight from it which means that actually, even though they think they're enjoying the drama of life, they're becoming increasingly cut off from life because they're just going with the ups and downs, not themselves becoming more and more attuned and so entering, embracing, seeing, seeing further into reality. Because that's what the paradise promises. But unless you follow closely in my wake, Dante says, before the waves, as it were, close behind the path that I'm about to furrow, and so leave you just being tossed around on the waves. Unless you follow closely what he's going to show, you risk getting lost, and how terrible that lostness is. We need to be following Dante, not just enjoying the imagery, but sharpening our understanding so that our desire can follow close behind his desire and be led to all that he's going to see. It's a strong warning. Do you dare carry on? He himself then calls on Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, to guide his way. He calls on Apollo, the god of light, to fill his sails, to power this journey. He calls on all the muses, which is to say all his own poetic powers, to find the right words and combination of words and singing of words that can communicate this to us. But he says, if you long for the bread of angels, if you long for the knowledge of God, of reality, of the fullest truth that the human mind is capable, then do eat, do follow, do try and track his way and make his way your own so that it can expand your own imagination and become life for you as much as it is life for the cosmos itself. He says we also need to be prepared to see what we completely don't expect, what we completely don't know about now, much as Jason's Argonauts saw Jason when he went to retrieve the Golden Fleece at various points doing things like, I don't know, ploughing a field with a fire-breathing bull and planting dragon's teeth in the soil from which an army would arise. It's a, a very extraordinary image that he provokes at this point, um, but it's to say you've got to expect the completely unexpected if you want to follow me on this journey. It's a very different kind of knowing that in this early canto of the paradise we're being invited to contemplate. You know, it's not like the inferno where we followed the shadows of the human mind into its darkest recesses. It's not like the purgatory where we follow the struggle of the human person, the human psyche, with virtue, with vice, 
and with the way that things go wrong, wrestling with ourselves as we wrestled up Mount Purgatory. This now is a different kind of knowing. It's at once a kind of receptive thirst, longing to receive more, as it is an imaginative love, so enjoying receiving and making something of it, so that, thirdly, it's a kind of participation in the beauty of the world, so that we too can share in that delight. So there's that kind of threefold movement, receiving, making, participating. You know, other poets have alluded to it. Um, there's Wordsworth's notion of the feeling intellect that brings those two aspects together. There's Blake's notion of the golden thread following something that you wind into a ball. Um, there's Owen Barfield's notion of following the energy of the poem so that it becomes a world in itself that you can inhabit. This is the dynamic which can lead us into paradise, into heaven. And right early on in the paradise, Dante is giving us strong hints that not only this is what it's about, but that we must follow this way in the way that it's actually about, leaving behind what we have used before to accompany him on his pilgrimage and taking up this new dynamic, this new way of engaging with things. And this second canto is going to show us, at least in a first instance, what that can be about. It is new, it is different, but I think there's already intimations of this in mundane life. Um, you know, the scientist does this when they follow a line of inquiry, when they follow the evidence and see that the world is completely different from what they'd assumed before. It's called a scientific breakthrough. And then that breakthrough becomes the way that you understand the world. Um, the artist does it too when they hone their skills, when they understand their mediums more and more, so that they're then able to communicate a whole world through their skill, through their medium. You know, the musician does it when they learn the language, the voice of a particular composer, and so can draw us in to the whole world of that composition, of that composer. Um, the difference, I guess, with the spiritual scientist, the spiritual artist, um, is that they don't put any limits on what they can know. This is the journey right towards the divine. And so, you know, whereas the scientist might say, well, we must stay within the laws of physics and the musician must stay, we must say, you know, we must stay within the laws of harmony. Um, these, this way is to use those means, but to not put a cap on them, to see how far they can take you and then go further. Um, so I think that's the difference with the spiritual journey from, say, um, the scientist's journey, at least. Um, there's no limit to what might be seen here, um, even as there's also a similarity with following the line of life, with following the line of beauty, with following what you think you know to the edge of what you know, and then stepping into a new world. It's also like what meditators will tell you, um, that the power of the attention and being able to hold your mind steady enough to follow one thing, one thread, is that gradually what seemed like a detail, what seemed like something slight or small in your mind's eye, gradually becomes larger, gradually expands until it becomes your whole sight. And you realise that actually what seems small at once was the crucial piece, was in fact the source, was in fact the wellspring. And you can gradually align more and more with that source, with that wellspring, so that it becomes your whole life, because in a way that's what it was before, always. It's just that you were distracted by other things because the mind couldn't hold itself steady enough. So in meditation too, I think there's a similarity with what Dante is trying to show us now. and. Dante immediately does so because even as he's explaining what this new way of travelling is about, he finds himself in a new world. He's already risen through the heavens. He's already entered the first planetary sphere, the sphere of the moon. And this is crucial 
because when you see, you already are there in this new way of travelling. It's not something that, as it were, is proven objectively and that you stand and look upon. It's something that's experienced directly so that you find yourself already in this state. When you've got this mode of travel, you're already on the journey. You've already embarked. So in some ways, you know, you can't follow Dante through the paradise unless you've understood what he is trying to say. You will just see the poetry as brilliant poetry, but nothing more. You will just see the vivid imagery as vivid imagery, but still find yourself in the same world. But as you let his words soak into you, so you will find yourself in different worlds as you go through canto by canto. And they found themselves, therefore, in the first new sphere, the sphere of the moon. And Dante describes it as like being in a diamond with brilliant light, but at the same time as like being in a pearl with that kind of thickness, that viscosity of being. Um, he says that it's hard to understand rationally because he, though apparently a fleshly body, is now in this heavenly body. There was no distinction. He had become part of it as much as it was part of him. And again, that's a crucial insight into this new kind of journeying, because it's a journeying that is at once a union, but also a conscious union. So he stays himself, even as he feels himself to be entering the sphere of the moon, the world of the moon. And he immediately feels a new life flowing into him. He says that he realises that somehow he's left mortal life behind and is enjoying a new kind of eternal life and thanks God for it. He offers gratitude and a kind of humility, you know, the humility that knows we don't possess life but are able to receive life, um, the joy of that, the gratitude of that. But also, really importantly, he immediately has a question. He wants to understand He's not just going for the trip, he's going for the expansion of his own conscious participation in this life. And so he has a question for Beatrice. Now, Beatrice already knows that he has a question. They're sharing this telepathic state. Um, but nonetheless, he gives it voice. He gives it his own words. So, again, he can stay himself even as he enters this eternal world. And what he's interested in is why from Earth the moon seems to have shades and darkness as well as light. Um, he's just entered the sphere of the moon and has said it's like a diamond, has said it's like a pearl, um, which is a uniform, brilliant light. So how come from Earth it looks different, he asks. And he, first of all, proposes the kind of common or garden explanation of the medieval period. When people looked at the moon, saw its dark and shade, and thought that this was the curse of Cain that the moon was bearing. It wasn't a uniform light like the sun because Cain had killed Abel and so the moon was cast at least in part in shadow to reflect that experience. You know, human beings, you might say, would look at the moon and be reminded of the shadows that fall across their, their life, either, even as they saw the shadows seemingly fall across the moon. We still do that a bit when, for example, you might say, I know it's raining in my heart. The heart, which could be a place of lightness and breath, has become a place of sort of dampness um, and be feeling weighed down. Um, or, I don't know, you might talk about the curse of the noonday sun. The sun, which is its zenith, might draw you towards more life. Actually feels like a curse. It's sort of battering you down. It's making you wilt in its heat. Um, so similarly, I think the medieval mind would look at the moon and see a reflection of their own experience, um, see something of their own life written onto the heavenly spheres. Now, Beatrice says that's wrong, um, and she starts to explain that this is what could often happen when human beings try to use a combination of their senses and their reason. Um, left alone, that's too limited to understand these domains that they're now in. And at the same time, that's also to expand what it is to be in the sphere of the moon. 
um, because the sphere of the moon, um, the sublunary place, to use the more metaphorical phrase, which again people still use to mean a world that is transitional or isn't fully understood or that um, is in a kind of shadow. To be in the sphere of the moon is to be in the state of mind where what's mortal starts to seem immortal or what was contingent starts to shine with necessity or what was corruptible starts to show its incorruptibility or what seemed mutable starts to show the aspect by which it's unchanging. Now this is reflected in the moon that we know through the senses of course and the moon that has light and shade that can be full and all brightness but can be new and complete darkness that can be known as solid like a pearl or liquid like the light entering water, as Dante had previously described it. The moon is also associated with wandering as it wanders through its phases, meandering through life, um, or more seriously as going astray, losing the path, lunacy, becoming mad. And in fact, the souls which they'll meet in the sphere of the moon in the next canto are people that stepped away from the path. It's also a place of false imaginings. You know, is the moon reflecting light or is it a light itself? It's a place where we get confused between what is merely a reflection and what is the wellspring of light in all truth. It's to be in a state of mind dominated by the left hemisphere. If you're into in the Gilchrist study of brain lateralization, the left hemisphere being the approach to life that only trusts its own reason, only trusts its own senses, can't bring in the wider picture, can't bring in the imagination. That, you might say, is a lunar state of mind, even lunacy, as Ian McGilchrist expresses it. So I think, I hope that gives a sort of an understanding of how to start to think about this rising into these heavenly spheres. It's not a literal description of ascent, as if somehow Dante is a, an ignorant medieval mind who thought that by literally flying into the air he would fly somehow into the moon. Something much more subtle, which still obtains today that's going on, that the physical bodies that people saw in the skies were but reflections of states of mind which they felt within themselves. And so when you moved into that state of mind, you moved into the spiritual way of being that, in this case, the moon also reflected in its own way. And I think this is a really important first lesson in the paradise, which Dante was speaking to his first readers as well as to us, um, that spiritual materialism goes wrong when it collapses the spiritual world into the material world, when it doesn't keep open the multiple dimensions of reality. And my sense is that this is where astrology often goes wrong, um, that it uses physics to somehow discern the spiritual in too literal a way, too mechanical, too formulaic a way, rather than realising that the physical world shines with deeper truth because it reflects spiritual reality, which is so much more than physical reality. Everything cascades from the one, and it's by noticing how the particular reality we find ourselves in at the moment reflects aspects of that cascading, um, that we're able then to rise back up towards the divine, towards the one rather than getting stuck on any particular level and somehow saying this must be all of it, we must build heaven here. No, it's, it's dynamic, it's a journey, it's travelling. Um, and spiritual materialism that tries to fix things here in this reality on earth makes the mistake, I think, of not leaving one dimension behind by seeing that this dimension is actually a portal into other dimensions, into further higher aspects of reality. Now Beatrice gives Dante a kind of lesson in this, a kind of demonstration, um, so that he can feel his way into this more fully. 
Um, because Dante has said, look, I know that the moon's light and shadow is not because of the curse of Cain, but I have another scientific proposal, which is that the moon is made of material of different densities. And so something which is more dense is darker, something which is less dense is lighter. But Beatrice says, look, that can't be the case either. And she shows him how, broadly by saying, that if that were so, then the whole of reality would just be shades of grey um, by the amount that it did or didn't let the light through. She also shows him how by offering a thought experiment, a sort of demonstration, and she says to him, imagine that you're stood before two mirrors that are the same distance from you, and also a third mirror which is twice the distance from you as the first two. And then someone puts a candle, a light, behind your head. And you'll see the light, the candle, reflected in the mirrors. But what you'll notice is that if the quantity of light from the near mirrors is more than from the third mirror, the quality of the light is just the same. And so what she's nudging him towards, I think, is to stop thinking about quantities, as the density theory um, requires, and to start to think about qualities. And if you can think about qualities, then you start to move more deeply into this transitional state, the lunar state, to see more and more. And she says to him, you know, now that I've confused your density theory, um, your mind is kind of left blank, your intellect is stripped bare. That's a good state of mind to be in, another aspect of the lunar state of mind of not knowing and this transitional space because it will enable you to see an even brighter star, another ascent, another step forward on this journey. Um, again, this is the heavenly reflection of the truth which we've been following all the way through the inferno, that descent is linked to ascent. So now you might say that Dante's descent, because he's had to discard his theory, is the precursor to a new step forward, a new part of his ascent. And so now, with his intellect stripped bare, but with him being nudged towards thinking about quality rather than quantity, she can describe to him how things are actually working. And what she says is that there is the one light, there is the divine light, and that is the source and the wellspring of all vitality throughout the cosmos. But different bodies, different intelligences, different souls in the cosmos reflect the light in their own way. So whilst you can see the diversity of light in the cosmos, and particularly can see the different kinds of light in the moon, that diversity all reflects the one light, but in its own way, by its own virtues, you might say, by its own qualities, by its own personality and characteristic. So in the sublunary world, things can look very, very different indeed, but still, if you look more deeply, be reflecting the one light. She offers a couple more analogies to help our feeling intellect understand. Um, she says it's a bit like the blacksmith who uses the one hammer, but in many different ways in order to shape the metal and to produce the diversity of its reflecting surfaces. And um, well, she says it's also, you know, like our bodies, the different parts of our bodies perform their many diverse functions, and yet they make up the one body, which is our self, that we're identified with uniformly. You, know, you don't identify with your finger any more than your arm, or your toe any more than your leg, or your leg any more than your arm. It's all part of who you are. So the canto ends with a brilliant new image of the cosmos that Dante has gained by entering this lunar state of mind, this transitional state of mind, being prepared to see how things might change before his very eyes. And it's an image of the universe as full of virtues, as full of intelligences, as full of souls, both terrestrial and celestial, each in their own way, reflecting the one light. It's part of the dazzling vision, which of course you get literally physically when you stare up into the night sky, but which you can begin to understand by going on this imaginative journey too, by receiving the image 
and participating it body, mind and soul is but a reflection of spiritual reality too, which, as we're increasingly going to see, is a dazzling array of all sorts of life increasingly sharing more clearly in the one life. That too, to see that, is what it is to ascend.